Magandang hapon po sa kanilang lahat. Good afternoon. This is the fifth in the 2022 lecture series of the Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo. Good to see you all again. And to those joining for the first time, kamusta po? Tuloy po. Muscat is delighted by your presence. Today, we welcome with enormous delight Dr. Cherubim Kizon, if virtually. Muscat is fortunate to have been favored with her kind consent for a special lecture. She is based in New York and has sent us her talk. Dr. Kizon has been involved in research and contemporary fieldwork for many years on textiles and dressing traditions of a number of Mindanao Highland communities. She teaches in Seton Hall University, where she recently became the chair of her department, the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, Social Work, and Criminal Justice. Cherry is a published writer and an engaging, most compelling speaker on subjects of her expertise. But more about Dr. Kizon later, as she will be fittingly introduced by Muscat colleague Raymond Santiago. In the meantime, first a brief introduction of us, the Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo or Muscat, especially for those who have just joined us. Muscat is a foundation engaged in museum development collecting, studying, and safeguarding material culture and cultural education programs, with Unilab as its main benefactor. I am Corazon Alvina. The Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo's mission and vision are about knowledge, ancestral and contemporary. Muscat is committed to rediscovering, recuperating, celebrating, and preserving Philippine-inherited and transmitted kaalaman. Sharing knowledge is a good part of Muscat's work. We try to create the opportunities within which the public can discover, acknowledge, understand, and appreciate the many layers of Filipino kaalaman. Features of Philippine tangible and intangible culture are remarkable. Muscat's programs and projects are inspired by these. A keen custodian of tangible culture, Muscat's online presentations, Programs and publications with objects from the collection are conceptualized, mindful of careful research and ethical curatorship, maintaining the integrity of objects within the context particular to the source culture. To ensure correct scholarship, Muscat engages and collaborates with respected academics and acknowledged subject matter experts. There are processes that bring forth the most exquisite textile, the handsomest weapon, astonishing basketry. Muscat probes for the inspiration behind the creation of such culturally significant and aesthetically sound objects. Muscat is sensitive to the physicality and materiality of the objects themselves to guide the study of processes and technology and shepherd the conservation strategy for the well-being of the collection. Muscat has also operationalized collections management guidelines for registration and conservation. The bonds between humans and their environment and the balance that must be maintained between them receive the utmost regard from Muscat, as do the aesthetic integrity and creative philosophy, the outstanding skills, and the commitment of our artists. Muscat acknowledges the diva, spiritual sense and essence in Kaalaman. The resolve of the Museo ng Kaalamang Katutubo is to encourage, inspirit, and invigorate pride, admiration, and affection for Kaalamang Katutubo, as indeed for and in all things Philippine. As promised, we will listen to a more proper introduction of Dr. Kizon. May I ask Muscat colleague Raymond Santiago to do that? Please, Raymond. Thank you, Ms. Cora, and good afternoon to all our viewers. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Cherubim Kison. She is an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Seton Hall University, New Jersey. She teaches introductory courses in cultural and linguistic anthropology, qualitative research methods, anthropological theory, 
in advanced electives in visual anthropology and the anthropology of art. She finished her Bachelor's of Arts in Humanities at the University of the Philippines and her Master's in Art History and Criticism and Doctorate in Anthropology at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. She studies the knowledge systems and social formations interrelated with the textiles and dress of the Bogobo, one of several indigenous peoples of the Davao region in southern Mindanao. She has published widely on U.S. colonial-era museum collections of the Bogobo textiles, examined through the lens of contemporary fieldwork in the origin community with comparative research into related traditions among the Tiboli, the Bilaan, and the Mandaya. She is collaborating on a praxis-based assessment of the landmark IPRA law governing indigenous peoples in the Philippines. She continues to be interested in the complexity of indigenous semantic categories of cloth and dress and recently published on collaborative ethnobotanical research on textile plants used by the Tag- Tagabawa Bagobo in the Southeast Asia Research Journal. A recipient of numerous, numerous grants and awards internationally, as well as a member of various editorial, advisory, selection juries, academic steering committees, and association. Likewise, a well-published scholar on the subjects of weaving, textile and clothing, Mindanao, and her ethnic communities, a foremost authority and resource on our subject, this session on the anthropology of art, language, and DNA, Centering on her experience with the Bogobo community, Muscat is proud to have with us Dr. Cherubim Kison. Might I add, we will be entertaining questions after Dr. Kison's talk in our Q&A portion. And now, without further ado, let me turn over the virtual floor to Dr. Kison. Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and thank you to Cora Alvina and Muscat and, and Jerome uh, for arranging this uh, recording of this lecture. Uh, I'm going to speak about, um, the title is there, no? Anthropology of Art, Language and DNA, What the Bagobo Can Teach Us. Uh, this lecture began with Cora inviting me and saying I can lecture on any topic I like. And I thank Cora, Alvina, and Muscat for this opportunity because this is a, a fairly new um, area of research for me. So for those of you who are familiar with my research, uh, I am an anthropologist from Seton Hall University, but my prior training was actually in art history. So I've always been interested in art. In fact, my entry into anthropology came from my interest in art, wherein I found that the history of art as a discipline where I had my first um, graduate degree had limited usage for the kinds of questions I wanted to ask. Hence, I moved into anthropology to study anthropology of art. And for a number of others in the audience, you might be aware that my specialization in terms of what art form um, I focus on is actually the textiles, the indigenous textiles of the Southern Philippines, specifically focusing on the Bagobo. Um, of Mindanao. This is the Bogobo are indigenous peoples in southern Philippines um, whose homelands are found in more than one um, southern Mindanao province, which includes uh, the city of Davao, Davao del Sur, um, and parts uh, also of some surrounding provinces north of Mount Apo. Um, but generally, they refer to themselves uh, as the Bogobo. And so what I'd like to share in this talk today would be a fair, some kind of relatively new information that's come up like in the last couple of years um, that makes use of DNA studies in order to give us a deeper insight into this larger question, which is called the peopling of the Philippines, right? And so I want to be able to present some of my ideas and my observations on what my own research with the Bagobo can actually teach us about these types of inquiry that more recently make use of DNA. So, so that's why I have this very unusual title, right? Anthropology of Art, Language and DNA. 
So anthropology of art is something that I've been doing for more than 30 years. Uh, the study of language is again, something that is a little bit more recent, but it's part of my training when I shifted from art history to anthropology, my engagement with language. And then the DNA is of course, um, a recent um, study, I'm focusing on one particular study that was done like uh, in the last couple of years, but my training in four field anthropology in the US um, give, gave me some kind of foundation to be able to understand what it is that the researchers are trying to achieve, right, with, with that kind of DNA side. And then I bring it to the insights I learned from doing ethnography um, in the field, as well as research in museum collections of, of Bagobo textile um, in the US and Europe. So that's kind of like uh, the overview. It's a rather ambitious talk. It's a rather ambitious idea, but for me, it's a fairly new one and I'm actually welcoming the opportunity to think about right, what I'm trying to say about these various connections. Okay, so um, many of you who are fans of Muscat would know all about right, the, the larger, um, you might say, interest in thinking about Philippine indigenous heritage. And so my contribution to this is of course, my emphasis on my work on, 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 on the Bagobo. I'm not a historian, but any person who's trained in anthropology and cultural anthropology uh, has to engage with historical material in a systematic way. So in a way, anthropologists engage in the work of historians and anthropologists in a way engage in ethno-historical uh, projects right, and conversations, whether or not we intend to. Uh, and so when we think about who the Bagobo are in Southern Mindanao, there are many ways to approach it. And I've always approached them as individuals over time in the past and the current, uh, as, as individuals who make use of clothing as a meaningful way of expressing themselves. And this expression includes interpretations of identity and who they are. Hence, I call it dressed bodies, right? Because uh, dress, dressing is, is a form of communication. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a very important form of communication for indigenous peoples everywhere. Uh, and the reasoning for that is usually to not only self-identify, but also to, I guess, nod to, to your heritage and your ancestry. It's also an expression of your aesthetics, right? Uh, that you share with your community and among other many, many rich um, interpretive tropes. But when I say dress bodies, I refer right to this practice of, of, um, of mindfully, thoughtfully, um, choosing instances wherein an indigenous person will decide to put on their dress. In most cases, by now it's ceremonial dress and what that could possibly mean. So this is the slide that just shows you, I guess you might say some of the uh, as a fundamental time depth that I always have to engage in in my research. And so on the left, you have an image uh, that came from the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. And it is a portrait, uh, a formal portrait uh, shot by the Gerhard sisters. The Gerhard sisters are um, uh, by now, you know, uh, well-studied um, uh, professional photographers who were uh, one of the official photographers at the St. Louis World's Fair. And they were actually um, photographing participants in that fair, not limited, of course, to the Bagobo, not limited, of course, to the Philippines, uh, what they call the Philippines reservations in 1904 but essentially all of the individuals who, who were actually present at that World's Fair. So this particular image, you would see it has a little stamp from the Gerhard sisters um, studio. And it shows two of the Bagobo men who were there in 1904. And the one on the right is, uh, it has become quite famous by now, um, was famous in his time uh, as Datu Bulan. Um, and uh, so he, he's a named individual. Um, and here is another uh, fellow uh, Bagobo adult um, who was there, right, in full ceremonial uh, dress. Um, so that includes, right, uh, the headdress, right, the, the headcloth, the tampulo, right, uh, that includes the jacket, right, uh, which would be, uh, they call man's upper garment, umpak kamama, right, this, I'm using tagabo, tagabao, vagobo terms. And then the trousers, the short trousers that are fully beaded uh, and, and uh, it's called saroar, 
And then of course they would be barefoot, but they would also have around the knees on the man on the left, right, um, the, the vine leglets, ticos. And then of course we can't ignore the, the, the ceremonial swords that they were carrying um, in their hilts, the paliguma. Plus not so clear in this would be the, the accessories that they have as well, which would be in this case, uh, the, the ovary, um, the, the ivory um, ear um, ornament that uh, Tubulan on the right is wearing, as well as the, the beads, the beadwork that hangs around um, uh, below their chins. So this is, this is like 1904 understandings of what the Bagobo considers to be a, a dress body, right? So full ceremonial dress. And you see it, right, also in how they interpret, how they should be photographed. So the Gerhard sisters put them in this backdrop, right, and it's a formal photograph. There are lots of other photographs, of course, that were taken of the Bagobo and all other people who were on display in 1904, not limited to Filipinos. And of course, those other photographs would not look like this because if they were taken, let's say, by fair goers, because 1904 was also the time when the Kodak, Insta the Kodak camera right, was actually introduced to the public. So World's Fairs were these big events where in new things were being introduced to the public. So for example, in the Chicago World's Fair, they introduced um, the Ferris wheel and the ice cream cone, for example. Right? So, so in 1904, uh, the, co uh, the, co the Eastman company introduced the, the, you know, the portable handheld camera. The Gerhard sisters here were using an actual, you know, the heavy duty tripod kind of formal camera, not the kind that you can carry around. So it's a very different kind of device. But for our purposes, it shows us how um, the Gobo who were uh, participating in the World's Fair at this time, right, um, in a sense, conceived of how they should be photographed. So there is this kind of like formality to how they wish to be presented. The image on the right is a photograph that I took when I was in the field, um, and this was um, in 1994. And in this particular case, it was not at the World's Fair. It was actually in the home of this man and woman, um, Liawan and Paya Bato, um, in, in Kalinan, in Davao City. Uh, Davao City, when we say Davao City, for those of you who don't know it, it's, it's Davao City is actually quite huge. It's one of the largest cities by land area in the entire Philippines, probably is the largest. And entire portions of Davao City, as we know it, are actually um, pretty much forested, right? Or um, in the foothills of, of Mount Apo. So it's, it's a very, very large, ecologically diverse zone. Um, and um, a, a very significant segment of, of Davao City is considered by uh, Bagobo to be part of their homeland. So this is in the home of a couple. And they agreed when I arrived there, of course, they were wearing ordinary clothing because we don't go around dressed like that, right? We, we wear everyday clothes, but uh, they agreed to be photographed. They put on right, their um, the heirloom clothing in the family. And they asked, they actually preferred to be photographed right next to this, uh, in the very middle of this image, you'll see um, an altar post. Now this photo was published in 1998 in the book in, from a rainbow's very hue in the chapter I contributed to that, um, that focus on the Bagoba and the Blan. So this is not an, a new image. Again, this image has actually been, been, been published elsewhere. But what I present you here again is their notion, right, of Obak Bagobo, Bagobo dress, right? So, so you see that from 1904 to 1994, this is like a hundred, you know, near, nearly 100 years, 90 years difference. And I submit to you that Liawan and Paya Bato don't have the Gerhard sisters portrait in their home. It's not something that they're, you know, historically aware of. Instead, what they have is that template in their minds of what the heritage of the Bagobo dress should look like, right? So, so the template, you might say is surprisingly rather stable, right? So you would see here um, uh, Liao Wan Bato, the, the late Liao Wan Bato, right? With the ceremonial headdress, right? You see the jacket, right? So you see the, the short trousers, you see the tikas, the leglets, right? So you see that, that, that that's pretty consistent, right? In, in many cases with what we find here, he does not have, uh, it's not visible here anyway, um, whether or not, I don't remember if he had the paliguma or a sword with him. But here we also have his wife, right? Um, Paya Bato with um, the female ceremonial dress, Umpak Pagobo, uh, or they would say female dress, right? Umpak right? So clothes of, of the female, which would be, um, the ikat skirt, wrap skirt here, uh, in this case, a bell sleeved um, top with a lot of, of beadwork. She has on her head a headdress, not a head cloth, but it's a headdress. It's, a, it's, it's kind of like an elaborate um, comb with feathers um, and beadwork on the lolin. 
and um, she would have also be worked that below her chin ceremony dress, but, and they would be in bare feet. And they asked to be photographed next to this um, uh, platform, which is like a, an altar post, common all over um, the Pacific actually, right? Uh, where they would put um, small gifts to the spirits, but this particular altar post was erected um, to celebrate uh, one of their um, uh, uh, family's wedding. There was a wedding in the family. So it was an altar post that they just recently put up uh, because uh, the man here, uh, Leo and Bato himself was also right, a practitioner of a global uh, traditional uh, religion. Right? Um, having said all that, of course, most of the Bagobo today will also tell you that they are also Christian. Right, so, so there is this, this hybridity of, of experiences that we need to kind of keep in mind that um, there's a stability in their, in their dressed bodies, this notion of what constitutes of a ceremony dress, but it doesn't mean at all that the family of, the, of, of Yawan and Payabato who are still right in Davao and definitely a part of, of modern life, um, we cannot assume that, that somehow they're cut off right from, from, from the rest of, of Society, not at all, uh, far from it. Hence, we need to contextualize that even these two men who were in 1904 in St. Louis were also not cut off uh, from, from the fairgoers, American fairgoers who were actually seeing them um, on a regular basis. And we now know have interacted with many of them. Um, uh, it's less evident for the Bagobo, but it's clearer with the Igorot who were on display in 1904. That, that there was a great deal of interaction because the Igorot, um, and the Igorot is the term that's actually used, right? So some of them were Suyo, some of them were Bonto, but the Igorot who were in St. Louis, right? A significant number of them were actually very conversant in English. And it's quite likely that the Bagobo uh, who were there also have some language facility because there were some direct interactions um, with Fairgoers, not the least of which would be the Metcalf sisters who I studied. Um, and who eventually visited Mindanao um, themselves after encountering um, the Bogobo there. So anyway, so here for this particular site, right, it's to demonstrate what I think is, is now well known um, in, in the, you might say, the anthropological research record, in the museum research record, in the record of art history that looks at textiles and dress. Um, and this is something that many of you in the audience might have encountered perhaps indirectly or perhaps directly with, with my research. But I can only tell you that in 1993, when I began this entire uh, engagement with the global textiles, in 1993, it was not clear to anybody whether or not there was still any global weaving, right? So, so it's hard to believe, but that was actually a question that was put out there. It was not clear in 1993 if there was still anything going on. And we see that certainly there is. Um, how we conceive of that and in what ways that it's persisted and in what ways certain other practices have not persisted is a separate discussion. But here is the first idea, right? So when we think about identity and history, we think about individuals, we think about people, we think about families, uh, we think about territory, right? Think about place. So, so the notion of identity and history are, are very much entangled and embedded. And the ways that we as scholars study them would be through meeting people, right? Interviews, through visiting them and living amongst them where they are, which would be ethnographic right, methods. It would also be, of course, historical, looking at archives. Right? So we have all these many ways as scholars and as students on how we kind of learn more and improve our understanding of, of this kind of larger question. Um, but the new element that I bring here would be uh, what I call the DNA studies. It's just my shortcut for it. And uh, this is an article that was published in 2021 um, in uh, PNAS and um, published by Lorena and others called Multiple Migrations to the Philippines during the last 50,000 years. So you might say, you know, wow, that's a very ambitious uh, project. How does one even do that. And from a larger context, when we think about Southeast Asia as a whole, um, or even the spread of human populations out of Africa, right, as a whole, uh, Southeast Asia is actually one of the most exciting places to be if you are an archaeologist or anthropologist interested right, in, er in early peopling, right, of, of the islands. 
uh, of, of the archipelagic part of Southeast Asia, which includes the Philippines. So one of the methodologies that have been used to try to understand this would be to look at any form of information that we know to be pattern. So for DNA, um, it's a device, it's a, it's a technique that's used in many, many cases, for humans, as well as plants, right? Animals, it's used in, in many, many fields. But this particular um, publication, uh, which has its own challenges, right? There's a great deal of criticism for it in, in, in certain cases, not the least of which was that the question of whether or not free prior informed consent um, was actually implemented in each of those areas where DNA was collected. I'm not here to discuss that. Uh, I, I believe that there's things I can say about that, but what I am here to present would be to show you, right? This map, which comes with that publication. And in this map, it shows you, right? The map of the Philippines, and it shows you these multicolored dots. And all of those dots correspond to the information that they finally gathered and analyzed based on, on using DNA techniques. And what I want to call your attention to is the way that this uh, sets of data was presented, or you might say, um, you know, in terms of the groupings that emerged from what the map suggests to us, is that you have this number of, of groups that have been determined through this whole DNA inquiry, right? So Negrito, Batani, Cordillera, and so all of these um, terms are here. And then they actually plot it also on the map. So of course I studied Mindanao, so I'm down here. So for me, the groupings of interest would be the populations that are shown to be distributed here in this map. And in this map, they would be the, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but they would be like what appears to me in my screen, like a yellow and orange and a red. So it would be these three bottom categories, Mansakan, Manobo, and Bilik, and Samil, right? So Mansakan would be the red ones, and they're mostly like on this. And Manobo would be the yellow, and you see this a very large distribution of Manobo. And then Bilik and Sangi, which, which orange, which would actually be like more limited in their in their distribution over here. So I bring this up because um, it's not it's possible that many are aware of it who are present here listening to this talk, but it's quite also possible that a number of people are not aware that, that this study um, has come about. And essentially part of the what, what is really of interest to folks who are doing these types of studies is because they're really trying to understand what's called um, uh, the Negrito issue, right? So it's always a question of, you know, so we, we know the Negritos as, 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 a, as a population, as an indigenous population autochthonous to the Philippines, but you would have also similar populations that are, they go by different terms, right? In other parts of Southeast Asia, such as in what we now know as Malaysia, right? As well as what we now know as um, uh, parts of, of, of Borneo Kalimantan, but, but we would have these populations that we refer to, right? As, as uh, some, authors would refer to as the Negrito issue, Negrito need to problem, because it's this larger question of, you know, how did humans um, essentially move out of Africa into Southeast Asia? So the DNA question, the DNA methodology is being used here to try to ask this question about um, trying to understand uh, the peopling, right, of, of, the, of Southeast Asia, which in this case focuses on the Philippines, around the same time that we know anatomically modern humans um, uh, have been found, right, in, 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 in our part of Southeast Asia. So the numbers are around 60,000 to 70,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago. So, so it's, it's a, I, I mean, this is like the rough time frame, right, that's consistent. We know that anatomically modern humans have, um, have moved into Southeast Asia. I'm not even going to engage as to whether they came from north, right, north of us or south of us. That's a whole other debate. But this is like trying to, you know, see if DNA can can be of help in trying to answer this question. So my interest it would be here in Mindanao, and it would be the last three items on their map, which refers to what the researchers call Mansakan, Manobo, and Bilik and Sangil, with their corresponding colors. Now, what's interesting to me when I first read this article was that the way by which the authors um, grouped the, uh, the populations is actually using linguistic um, terminology. So Bilik and Sangil, for example. So Bilik is, is a, as an example of, of a language grouping. 
that encompasses uh, Blaan and Tiboli, as well as one of the Bagobo languages, which is Jangan or sometimes called Plata Bagobo. So Bilik is, is encompasses those, uh, all those languages, Blaan, uh, Tiboli, and Jangan or Plata Bagobo. Uh, Sangil would encompass, of course, languages that consider to be spoken by people who uh, are believed to be primarily around the Sangil Islands. And the Manobo language is a very large language grouping um, that includes the two other groupings of the Bagobo, the Tagabawa Bagobo and the Obo Bagobo, right? So Bagobo self-identify, at least from around the 1960s, we're pretty sure of it. It could be earlier, but from, from the evidence, it seems that uh, maybe even in the 50s, like somewhere, sometime post-war, there was this kind of tripartite Bagobo identity wherein Bagobo was self-identifying as Bagobo, but somehow were also self-identifying with a hyphen, right? So they would be Tagabawa Bagobo, which literally means Southern Bagobo, right? Obo Bagobo, uh, as well as Jangan or Plata Bagobo. So it, it's, um, it uh, is of interest to me because of the language. So this is, this is where you might say, um, the Bagobo can teach us a lot, right? So one of the things that the Bagobo have taught me is that when we speak of identity from the viewpoint of the indigenous peoples that self-identify using an ethnonym, our assumption that that ethnonym encompasses a single language is actually wrong. In other words, here is a group of people who have been referred to as Bagobo for at least, for more than a century, right? Uh, the earliest that I could find that referred to the Bagobo stuff, uh, but Bagobo as a terminology, right, is something like in the 1880s, but it's certainly earlier than that. But the 1880s is like, the, if you want to be very conservative, in the 1880s, we have dictionaries, right, that, that, uh, that were published uh, by missionaries that make use of Bagobo as a terminology, but it's actually Tagabao Bagobo, but still it was Bagobo. We have um, collections of, of uh, artifacts that were uh, that are in European museums identified as such. So the term itself, Bagobo, is not a new term, it's an old term, but maybe not as old as 50,000 years, not at all, right? But for sure, it's a term that's, uh, the time depth is, is certainly um, by the late 19th century, it was a term that's being used. But what we're learning through field work in the late 20th century, as well as all the research that's been done uh, since the post-war, post-World War II, is that um, it is a tripartite identity that is not limited to a single language. Hence, when we talk about Manobo, Bilik, and Sangil, and Mansakan, I'm not even going to mention Mansakan here, but Mansakan would be a, a different language right? grouping right, within Southern Mindanao. But these uh, individuals live in communities that are neighboring with each other, right? Some of them are in mixed communities and some of them are not. So that's the first thing we learn that, that, uh, that the Bogobo can teach us, that, that identity is not necessarily a linguistic identity. The linguistic identity is important, but it is not the sole basis for ethnic self-identification. And so when we have a DNA study that groups the data through language groupings, you have here a very important assumption being made. And that assumption is that if someone self-identifies or speaks a language, then you're also assuming that there's a reasonable expectation that the people who speak that language only reproduce or marry or have children or form families with others who also share that language. In other words, a DNA study is about sexual reproduction. It's about offspring, right? It's about who had babies with whom and what happened to those babies and those adults who then formed right communities and families and all that. So if you're going to use linguistic labeling to refer to these populations, then you also have this very large assumption that you're assuming that those linguistic populations are essentially, for lack of a better word, marrying within the group, right? So that's a very big assumption. So the assumption being that, that um, these populations for 50,000 years or so are for the large part, Anthropologists will use the term endogamous, right? endo meaning inside or within, and gamos meaning right to marry or intermarry. So it's a very large endogamous assumption being made here. 
And that's the other thing that I've learned in my own research. And I go back to my prior slide. And here you have this lovely couple, right, uh, the late Liawan and Payabato, who I encounter in a territory that is irrevocably Jangan or Klata. This is in, in Sirib, in, in, in the Sirib area in, in Kalinan. And the language that was being spoken uh, in that particular context was, of course, Iguano, because this is, this is right, this is Davao, but also Jangan or Klata. Right, so the assumption was that this was their identity. But only over time did I learn that Mrs. Bato, right, uh, Paya Bato, who speaks Jangan and is married to a Jangan man, lives in the Jangan uh, um, area, is herself Tagabawa. So in other words, she grew up somewhere else because she married uh, and moved to her husband's um, territory. But she herself is Tagabawa. She spoke Tagabawa. She was raised as a Tagabawa kid. And the only reason why this became emergent is because I was with two uh, research uh, staff who were helping me. And these two were Bagobo, but one was Jangan and one is Tagabawa. And it became apparent just through this conversation that, oh, you know, she is Tagabawa and he is Jangan. So just in this particular instance, the assumption of endogamous behaviors that go over time, right, at, at the many, very minimum needs to be a kind of challenge. I'm not saying that it's a completely null set. I'm saying that that needs to be kind of put into consideration. Is that the best way by which this kind of approach using DNA um, um, can be analyzed, right? Um, of course, there is the larger issue, right, the larger issue about whether or not the uh, folks who participated in the study freely right, gave consent uh, and were fully aware of what the study was about, right? So, so it was a question of, you know, it's a whole ethical issue, which I'm sure, right, can, can be handled in a different forum. And I speak, right, uh, very much in, in, the, in, in the side, right, of, of always making sure, right, that there is a full, free and ongoing consent, right, in terms of what um, the... the the body fluids that were collected, right? The body, uh, the, 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 the not necessarily body fluids, uh, but but the DNA material that's collected, right? That the participants involved are aware, right? That this is what it's what it's for. Now, having said that, I also know for a fact that in all my conversations with indigenous peoples, not limited to the Pagobo, that they're always, always excited about thinking about their heritage or their history. So I have no doubt that it's you know, that it's quite likely that, that many participants would say, yes, we want to participate in that kind of question and contribute to that kind of research. So, but whether or not that was the case for this one, I cannot speak to that. But I can only say to you that, that you know, that the, that the question is an interesting question, um, but then the assumption of how we can interpret the DNA data um, needs to be brought up. So. Here's my next slide. So my next slide um, is kind of going into this notion of what the Bagobo have taught me, which is that when we define community, we need to define community polythetically, which means it cannot just be one basis, such as language. It can't also be one basis either, such as DNA, right? Uh, because what anthropology has taught me is that our social persona is always going to be the more important and significant and more powerful marker as opposed to, let's say, our DNA. So in other words, in cases where there is adoption, for example, and this is not confined to the Philippines, this is kind of worldwide, in situations wherein people adopt children or people adopt uh, you know, spouses for their future children or all kinds of, of forms of, of social parentage, social parentage always, almost always, right, uh, wins or trumps over right, biological parentage. So even though DNA is, is seen as some kind of gold standard, in most cases, people will feel a loyalty, will feel a love, will feel connected socially with whoever it was that raised them, right? So, so it's, it's actually very, very complex. So your descent descent, D-S-E-N-T, descent meaning right, your parentage, where the people that gave you your biological material are always going to be relevant, but they're not the only basis. So, so descent is one, language is one, but there are others, right? And so what I 
propose here would be like a more critical engagement with institutional data, right? So the one on the left, the two images on the left are just examples of images that I took when I'm studying um, historical collections of, of Pagopo textiles, in this case, the Metcalf collection of the Smithsonian, right? So um, it shows you here that the tag, you know, this is about uh, early 20th century and it's, and you see the condition of the textiles and you see the detail here and I have my pen that shows you. So that's the kind of stuff that, that I would do when I would study um, the material um, aspects, right, of, of, of textile arts. Um, and so when you when one engages with it, when I engage with it, when anybody who does this engages with it, they, we will always be critical or at least mindful of how did this get here? What were the conditions by which they were um, collected? Uh, how do we know it's from where it's supposed to come from? So there's always this kind of skepticism and crit critical distance to establish whether or not we're sure that this belongs to that group, that it is indeed Bagobo, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's always that. Um, but here on the right, I show you a, a National Museum um, map from 1974 that again seeks to try to right, plot for us from a graphic perspective, right, the diversity of um, identities uh, within the Philippines. And, um, and this kind of shows you the different regions. The yellows are actually, it's, it's seeking to simplify a topographic map. So it kind of shows you some of the higher inland areas. Uh, and all of these smaller print just lists all of these um, various, we call them in the Philippines, we tend to refer to them as ethnolinguistic groups. More recently, sometimes we refer to some of these groupings as IPs or indigenous peoples, right? Um, and the terminology varies, right? In Northern Luzon, some of the groups would refer to themselves as Igorot, some would not. And in Mindanao, uh, some of the groups would refer to themselves as Lumad and some will not, right? So, so there's, there's quite a bit of terminology, but but when we have maps such as this, we don't throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? So so some of this we we have critical criticisms of, right? But we also have to understand that in 1974, this was their baseline understanding of how those groupings can be mapped and uh, determined and listed. So it's always going to be a challenge because you say, wow, you know, all of these groupings and all these languages, uh, do we really have that many? Um, and the answer is uh, yes, we we really do. Uh, and here comes right the, the next item in this whole discussion of defining everything polythetically. We talked about DNA, we talked about dressed bodies, right, and, and community perceptions of what constitutes heritage. I presented here about the need to always approach institutional data critically, but to engage with it, right? Um, and so here comes right language. And so I go back to language. So in the 1880s, um, Alexander Schadenberg uh, visited uh, Bogobo in uh, Todaya Falls, right? Uh, Matteo Hisbert, a Jesuit, produced a dictionary. Uh, a Spanish uh, official, uh, Rahal, and a French uh, natural historian, Montano, went up to Mount Apo. So we know that in the 1880s, there was a term the Bogobo. These are the museum collections I have studied uh, from a couple of pieces that Schadenberg has in Leiden to various museums of the Louisiana Purchase Exposition, Museum of Natural History for uh, Laura Watson Benedict's collection, Faye Cooper Cole's collection in the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago, and the Metcalf Sisters collection at the Smithsonian in the Japan. So I, so you can actually, so this is kind of like, so in all of those places, yes, Bogobo is a term uh, in the Bogobo language. Uh, it, 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 language is not a null category. There is a specific terminology used to refer to it. And that the Agobo certainly are referred to in anthropological and historical fieldwork um, by Filipino anthropologists such as uh, Arsenio Manuel, um, the late Kenneth Payne, Rudy Rodil, uh, historian Shinsu Hayase, um, anthropologist um, Heidi Gloria, Right, as well as field-based linguistic research by linguists such as um, Elkins and Dubois. So there's a lot of, of studies that's already been done to talk about Bagobo as an identity category, as a language category, as a way by which Bagobo refer to themselves. So, so there, there's quite a bit there. Of course, there's even other uh, more recent um, you might say, information that's, that is available to us. So Bible translation, the SIL, the Summer Institute of Linguistics, um, very active right, in, in, in the Bagobo areas. Uh, many Philippine government agencies from the, com uh, from the Commission of National Integration, from 
post-war, right, early on in Philippine independence, to Panamint in the 1970s, right? But we know that by, by 1960s, we already have a gobo that has this tripartite identity. So that's what we learn, right? So they're Bagobo, but they don't speak the same language. And I should know because when I reached the field, I discovered that I have to basically choose the language that I have to learn for my field language. Um, and I, because I don't have the language skills to study three, and I ended up um, selecting Tagabawa Bagobo. Um, but by the 1990s field work, I am always aware that Pagobo will refer to themselves as either Tagabawa Pagobo Chan or Klata Pagobo or Ubo Pagobo. So that's pretty much established. And how do they hyphenate? How is the basis of hyphenization? <laughs> uh, how, does it, how does it emerge? What if you are Jangan Pagobo, but you don't speak Jangan, right? Which is very common for, for many uh, Many contexts. What if you're Tagabawa Bagobo, but you only speak Cebuano, right? What if you're Obo Bagobo, right? So, so, so what we do discover is that self expression, right, is not only dependent on language, but it also depends on, right, who's my father, who's my mother, who are my grandparents. So, definitely this polythetic way of, of self reference. But for sure, to be Bagobo is not to speak one language by the 1990s fieldwork. What they do share would be material culture. Uh, they share this notion of a dressed body, right? This is how you're so, a beautiful dressed body should look like. They might share a contiguous territory, right? but they don't share language. So this is a very important thing. So two things already that we're learning that the Bagobo have taught me. Language, right, is not the same as your identity. It's part of it, but it's not the only basis for it. DNA cannot be seen as self-evident, right? Because one does not only marry within one's specific um, community. It depends on how people self-identify. I don't go even here into examples of many indigenous peoples who marry, let's say, people who they refer to as Visayan. So there's quite a bit of marriage amongst Visaya. They would say Visaya, right? So they would say that I married um, a nun fill in the blank, non Tiboli, non Bagobo, non Andaya. And the advantage to that is, and then they will say, oh, well, we didn't have to do, you know, do all of these uh, bride wealth payments of horses and Carabao, for example. So, so there are all kinds of, of, of a great deal of awareness that, but for sure, right, there's a great deal of intermarriage that does take place. So how does one self-identify if one is a product of an intermarriage? Right? That's another interesting question that, again, should not be assumed as self-evident. So three Pagobo languages, uh, a shared contiguous territory around um, uh, uh, the mountains, uh, the Mount Ako system of mountains, right? And so what I'm showing you here in this slide would be a couple of maps that are not mine, but I borrow, I present to you from the research of, of other people. So here you have a map that comes from um, Richard Elkins' 1974 publication, where he shows you um, in these three-letter words, uh, three-letter um, acronyms, they're like shortcuts for, for, for languages, right? And so you see, for example, THG for Tagabawa around this area, which where I did my field work. You see here Obo to refer right, to, to the Obo language, right? And you see all these lines that point to them identifying um, their uh, groupings, right? The, the larger family that they belong to. So you see, for example, here that these are all Manobo languages, but the point of this, this, this map is to show you that just for the Obo Bagobo and the Tagabao Bagobo alone, using Elkin's system, we see that the Obo belong to the Western Manobo grouping, linguistic grouping, whereas the Tagabao Bagobo belong to the Southern Manobo grouping, which means the Tagabao Bagobo is, is uh, farther away from Obobagobo linguistically than let's say Tagabawa Bagobo with let's say Sarangani, right, Manobo, right? Or Obobagobo versus let's say uh, Western Bukidnon Manobo. So you have these kinds of, 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 of things to keep in mind. So this is linguistic. So from a linguistic standpoint, if we just take the language and study the language as they are, it shows that, that right, that ethnic, 
self-identification as being shared does not necessarily mean that you share it with the languages that are closest to you linguistically, right? So it's clearly not a um, language uh, alone. And I have here in my caption that uh, Klata or Jangan is, is a Bilic language. It's not Monobo, therefore it's not on Elkin's map here. Um, and though I have all those little orange, uh, yellow things to show you um, that area that is of interest um, to me. On the left is a map that was, uh, comes from the work of a historian, Shinsu Hayase, um, who studied uh, Bagobo and Japanese right, identities uh, and Davao, and, and right, it's a, he's, he's a historian of, 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 of Mindanao, uh, among others. And what he did was he did a number of interviews with various Bagobo families in the area. And he produced this map and it's called here, distribution map of three language groups of Bagobo, consistent with what I've been talking so far about, right? That the Bagobo self-identifies belonging to three groups. So you here have a map that instead of showing you the linguistic relationship, it just shows you their distribution territorially. So he has this uh, light shading here of what is the Tagabao Pagobo, what they consider to be their homeland, right? Ah, they would say this is a homeland. In reality, of course, we know the problems that indigenous peoples face, wherein in their homelands, in most cases, are not always theirs anymore. Uh, but that's a whole separate discussion, right? Some of them have ancestral domain claims and some of them do not. The darker shade up here, which is on uh, the border of a separate province, right, is uh, like, for example, you have here to the Pawan, right? Um, are the area that the Oboba Gobo considered to be their traditional territory, right? And you have here Mount Apo and Mount Talong right here in the middle. Um, and then the Klata um, would, would consider their territory to be right on this, more of on this side, right, of the mountain. So as you can see, it, 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 what the Bagobo teaches us is actually not an easy lesson. The Bagobo is teaching us a very complex lesson about identity, that it's language, it is descent, D-E-S-C-N-T, remember, that's what I mean by descent, right? Uh, as well as territory. So, so this is also part of how one knows one belongs to a group. Because I was born there, because I grew up there, because my family is there, because my homeland is there. Okay, so I put back, right, uh, that area, that's roughly what is being shown uh, on Sayas, Hayas's map um, on the left. So what I have now here uh, that's overlaying the slide would just be screenshots of one of my favorite databases ever, which is blotolog.org, blotolog where it shows you immediately from just a pure linguistic standpoint where language belongs and which language is closest to another. Right? Again, purely linguistically, not DNA, not territory, just from a language perspective. And you see here that the la large language family, of course, is Austronesian. All Philippine languages belong to the Austronesian um, language family. And we see here that after Austronesian, Malay, Polynesian, Greater Central Philippine, Manobo, we see here, of course, uh, South Manobo, right? So this is the Tagabawa. Um, and then I did another screenshot uh, this time for the Obo Manobo, and again, everything's the same, Austronesian, Malay, Polynesian, Greater Central Philippine Manobo. But you see that now instead of South Manobo, it's West Manobo. So, so in other words, what I'm showing here is that what Elkins has published in 1974 has held up over time because this is the database that's actually um, the most up to date. It's, it's managed by the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Sciences in Germany. Um, and it's fabulous because it's quite interactive. And of course, I did the same for um, Jangan or Plata. And you see how different it is, right? Austronesian language family, Malay Polynesian. But because it's Bilic, right, we see that the Jangan or the Plata, right, have a very, you mo the most distant, you might say, linguistically from the others. But they're all Bagobo. So we need to problematize, we, not problematize as into challenge. Uh, we need to kind of uh, make ourselves aware of the polythetic nature of ethnicity and ethnic self-identification. So the research implications um, would be that whenever we think of things such as DNA, right, our assumptions about the DNA data um, need to be made a little clearer. So was, was the sampling done assuming that linguistic self-identification is the reproductive population, right? 
I don't know the answer to that. Uh, is the assumption that such language groupings is stable over time, is that an assumption that can be used for something that's supposed to go back 50,000 years? I don't know. I think it might have some use, but perhaps limited use. Right? Um, but for sure, if the idea is to make use of hypothesis testing, the lessons we learn from the Bagobo, right, tell us that these kinds of inquiries certainly need the input right, of people, we say, from below, right, the people who are being studied. Um, and not just their consent, right, but also the knowledge system that underlies how one can even self-identify as fill in the blank, right, whatever that, that ethnic self-identification might be. So for any future hypothesis testing, right, we cannot set aside this, this information, ethnographic, linguistic, historical, and museological research data, right, um, which are generated with the participation uh, and awareness of the communities uh, that are being studied um, need to be brought to bear to the kinds of uh, questions we ask and the kinds of conclusions we seek um, to get. Uh, and I think that's where I will end this and thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kison, for a most um, interesting and I must say, a provocative talk at that. At this point, uh, we would like to ask uh, Dr. Kison, with her permission, uh, to begin the question and answer segment uh, of the discussion this afternoon. Hello, Dr. Kison. Um, good afternoon in the Philippines. Uh, uh, good morning from here. <laughs> uh, it's a madaling araw sa okay. New York, but uh, I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here with, with everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, might I uh, start with the first question, uh, Dr. Kison? Sure. Okay. Uh, we have a question uh, from a friend. Uh, may we know uh, more about the Metcalf sisters, who they were, and uh, were they anthropologists? Um, thank you. Yeah, that's that's a great question. I guess um, in our day, we would refer to them as, as self-taught anthropologists, right? They didn't study anthropology as, um, as a degree. In fact, the background of um, Elizabeth Metcalf is really a uh, musical. I think they're, they're, they're daughters of, uh, I believe, a composer right, or a conductor. So it was really music that attracted them to, um, to the Bagobo in the, uh, they call it the, the Philippines Reservation. Uh, however, uh, when, they, um, uh, when, they, uh, when they came back to, to the U.S. after a sojourn in, in Mindanao, uh, one of them, Elizabeth, actually gave a lecture to the American Anthropological Association, right? gave a lecture about um, their experiences. And around that same time was also when they sold um, a portion of their collection to the University of Pennsylvania Museum. So, um, so it's it, at that time, I guess you would say that they came back from the field, but because they didn't have a professional identity as an anthropologist, uh, I believe that their work was at that time kind of ignored. Uh, so much so that when I went back to study the UPenn collection, for example, the, um, the curators, when they would write notes to accompany the collection, they essentially just referred to the work of another anthropologist who had the professional identity, Faye Cooper Cole, who was in the Field Museum. Uh, but they ignored, um, they had the notes that came with the collection, but they didn't really refer to the lecture she gave, for example. So, so it's one of those interesting kumaga betwixt and between. No? It's a, she, was a, she was like a, a, liminal, um, a liminal person. From my point of view, uh, she was engaging in a lot of work that you would say anthropologists were actually doing, but she wasn't trained. So much so that if you compare her to another, to them, the two sisters, to another American who was in the area was Laura Watson Benedict, who was mm. also the kind of overlap. She was actually a trained anthropologist. She was doing her PhD with Franz Boas. Yes. So, so the Metcalf sisters were, I find them really interesting because of, of what they were able to do um, uh, on their own, essentially. Uh, and so, but yeah, that, that's a great question. Thank you. Okay. 
uh, I might venture to ask, ma'am, uh, did their lack of training in the discipline compromise uh, what they were doing, uh, say, in the field? Uh, I Well, okay. In fact, I would even say that if I compare them to the experiences of Laura Watts and Benedict, their their experiences were actually a little bit better in terms of you know um, self care. Uh, Laura okay. Watson Benedict was was hungry. She was supporting her research by her teaching salary, right? So uh, the Metcalf sisters actually instead uh, went there uh, and ended up uh, opening a little shop, right? Uh, they, they they ended up opening um, a shop that that was also um, that they did in Manila, but they were also starting it out in in um, in, in the now. So so in terms of because they came in there not as researchers, they, they essentially entered as the expat, uh, the expat community. Their life was actually not as isolated as Laura Watson Benedict's. The, the value of the written material, though, it shows that they're not as deeply trained, right, as, as, as others like Craig Cooper Cole or Laura Watson Benedict. But when I looked at the quality of their collections, um, in a way, I feel that their their lack of training was actually good because their collection didn't just focus on, um, you know, the, the the nicest, the best, the most right, the most ritually significant. They also had a lot of less right special cloths um, in in their collection, which now I go back and I see, oh, that's actually very valuable, right? So you see a lot, a, a bigger variety, a bigger. Um, um, yeah, it, it was less less um, focusing on just right a, a certain segment of, of, of textile production, and because they also lived um, in the area in in different conditions, there were lots of letters right they have letters to to family and friends, uh, maraming letters. <laughs> so so that actually um, and and so you get this insight into you know comment political commentary of the day, maraming ganon. So so that that stuff. So in a way, I would say that um, if I try to shine a light using today's um, perspectives, there are actually few anthropologists whose methodologies will still be upheld <laughs> if, yes. if, we, you, if we shine today's light uh, in, in, in many cases. But in, the, in what they were able to accomplish in their time, right, I, I think is quite significant, quite significant, uh, even without this training. Okay. okay. Thank you, ma'am. Um, we move to the next question from Leonel Casimiro II. And I would like to um, uh, quote the, uh, uh, um, utter the question in verbatim. Is it considered that the Bagobo tribe has a sub-tribe uh, uh, because of the other variations of the language? Uh, he uses tribe here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, I understand right, that that. To use the, the word tribe is, is is always challenging, no? Uh, um, yes. But but so maybe if I, if I may, I would like to maybe substitute that with with something more neutral, which is like grouping. Shall we say grouping? Okay, whether we call it yes. tribe, tribal, right? Let's call it a grouping. So the question is. Yes. Thank you for making the correction. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, if you speak to people in the field, they actually say tribo. No, <laughs> they will actually say tribo. You know, yes. uh, yeah. it, it kind of, in, you know, it must must relax ang mga tao in the field, and also, so, so it will be, it will shift from tribo, it will shift to IP, it will shift to right. So it's iba iba yan. But, but, uh, but I, but from an anthropological standpoint, right? Uh, let's use the word grouping uh, because then we're not problematized with, you know, with. with defining uh, the, the heavy history of the word tribe. Um, so to talk about subgroupings um, is relevant, but when we say subgroupings, sometimes we think about them as lesser or greater than the other. You know, It, it becomes mm -hmm. like a measure of, of worth. I don't think the Bagobo would say that the Jangan the, or Klata or the Tagabawa or the um, Obo when they would say, and you might sometimes hear them use the term subtribe. You might yeah. sometimes hear them, a subgroup. Is, when they say that, they might not necessarily think of themselves as any lesser than the others. Uh, 
Mm. So, para siya, that is maga, what sub uh, means. Apo. Yeah, yeah. So, so not in that lesser, no, no moral greater or lesser. No? Yes. Of course, there's always ethnocentrism. No? Mas magaling kami, ganun <laughs> palagi. No? But, <laughs> but, but, um, but, there, but there's not a sense of, you know, that one is actually above the other. So, so that's what I would say that when you say sub. If the, if the question means, if I, if I recall right, not, not, not sub, that there's a subgrouping dahil marami sila, then I think the question is assuming that groupings don't have built in them this innate complexity. No? Okay. Kasi nabi mo ko sa grupo, what is the grupo? No? So, so in what I've said before, we can talk about DNA groupings. Yeah, mm-hmm. That can be done. No? Kasi then say, ito, 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 distant or near, ganyan. No? Uh, we can talk about language groupings. Mm. Um, or we can talk about, and the term I'm using is like groupings that are based on ethnicity. Yes. Self-identification, right? So, bagobo as a term is really used um, to self-identify, and that actually incorporates right language. So, iba-iba yung language, pero bagobo pa rin sa lahat. Um, material culture, and I believe a big part of that is also right contiguous territory and this history of intermarriage. Mm. So, this notion of uh, like preferred marriage partners, no? so, so that's why you would have Liawan and Paya Bato, right? Uh, who come from two subgroupings, sub no na ako, no? Um, But actually, I would actually refer to them instead as segments. No? So okay. segments probably better. No? Um, and but because they were living in Sirin, they self-identified as Jangan or Klata, no? and in yes. fact. They spoke Jana and Klata, including the wife who intermarried. No? Mm. But if I found them, let's say, in a Tagabawa area, they most likely will both say that self-identify as Tagabawa because mm. they would be in the Tagabawa area. Until you ask, you know, and then, then you know, then you find out. Right? So so it's a so that's why I mean by you know, this is the things that we learn from them. We learn that we might Kasi tayo, we might be too theoretical. We problematize things. So we will say, eh, but ganon? No? <laughs> How can that be? No? Ba- bakit ganyan? Ba- How can you be both bagobo but be, you know, have different languages? So I think the question should be, we should ask ourselves, what are we assuming about what belonging to a group means? No? Mm-hmm. Because we're assuming that somehow it should just be one. Uh, one language, for example. We're assuming that that uh, when we say, oh, I am X, therefore, everybody in my family says, magtanong ka. You will find that the X also has a Y. Ayo, oh, pinsan ko yon. <laughs> you know, the, then you discover all of these things. Um, because, you know, today and even back then, ethnic self- self-identification can be political. No, it can be political. Like in, in the U.S., for example, it was a very dangerous thing in the past to admit that you had Native American blood. Yes. Right. Uh, don't get a job. Right. Uh, you will be kicked out of housing. <laughs> All kinds of problems. And today, my students, undergrad students in the U.S., even my kids, when they were applying for college, would say, "I wish I were, so I can check this box and get a scholarship." So suddenly, right, uh, the, the 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 reality of of being Native American is is not as life threatening as it used to be. Uh, um, not saying that people are lying about who they are. They are no. It's it's your response to the social structural right conditions of the time. So it's a rather long answer. Pero yeah, the, the notion of sub, siguro I would not disagree because I would hear it. Pero it just let's not think of it as you know that they're organizing yes, themselves yes. into higher or lower. Huh? Um, more like segments and separate but equal. No, uh, I would say. Um, but the question also is you no. Know, Pero bakit sila nag self-identify? Diba? Bakit sila, bakit, why did this thing emerge? No? Some would just say, ay, ang bagobo, manobo din yan. But we see that it's not just the manobo. Kasi the jangan and klata don't speak manobo languages. No? So, so it's, it's, a, it's, a real, um, uh, it's a real conscious decision to say we are one people. And, and actually, we also intermarry. Now, having said that, we mustn't, think that they don't intermarry also outside, no? So, so mm-hmm. especially like in my principal area, sa southern Bagobo, sa, sa, sa Davao del Sur, may mga intermarriage din siyempre with Laan, for example, no? It's not unknown. In fact, even though 
um, it would be seen as ay ibang iba sila. It was still it happened. It would they would talk about these exciting marriages wherein people come from far away, no? So 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 there's quite a bit. Uh, so I didn't mention it in my talk, pero uh, you know, with COVID, I had to go back to existing data because I did, didn't do much no, of new research. And I discovered that I have you know, about 69 family interviews of, of people on their genealogy. You know? Now, of course, in, genealogical interviews have their own challenges because, you know, some there's be inaccuracies have to check and double check. No? But for sure, what emerged is like, wow, you know, people get around. <laughs> The nanny comes from here, yeah, then the, yeah, uh, yeah. so they really get around, and yes. it's it is not confined to just traditional, right? Um, yes, in, yes, no. Oh. It's really, really. There's a lot of movement, a lot of um, a lot of um, you know, awareness of 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 places way beyond what you would actually assume. So yun yung I think that would be the important thing. So even though you would say it is a stable identity because you can talk about it in terms of descent, in terms of territory, in terms of language. But that doesn't confine them at all, yes. right? Uh -uh. Uh -uh. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ma. Um, uh, the third question uh, from Yael Fernandez. I, I think you answered this, but uh, a, a, a little more um, magnification of the answer. Aside from DNA and language, what other considerations are there to identify ethnolinguistic groups? Well, okay, so babalik ako dun sa term ethnolinguistic groups. We like it in the Philippines, no? ethnolinguistic yes, groups. Uh -oh. um, and it's not completely a, a false idea. No? That, that mm -hmm. tends to be generally, you know, it kind of works. Like I would mm -hmm. say my father's Kapampangan, my mother's from Laguna, right? So, so we talk about mm -hmm. Tagalog, yung nanay ko, right? so we would, it's, it's something that is part of our daily life. Uh, but, but I would rather use the term that wouldn't, kind of embed the linguistics in it. So, sabi natin ethnicity, no? Let's say ethnicity. Although that, of course, itself is also, has its own challenges. Or shall we say um, ethnic self-identification, right? Yeah, marap, marap, you, let, let's say that. So, the question is, apart from DNA, apart from language, what else is there? Yes. Territory is a big thing, no? So, territory. So, I, I would rather call it territoriality, no? So, this notion of a homeland. Um, so, whether or not you were born there or whether or not you were never born there, but it's an ideological construct of saan ka galing, no? So you would say, um, and this is where the concept of a diaspora come in, no? So, so mm. it's possible for you to have been born far away and never have visited your so-called homeland, but it's very big in your consciousness that you come from a particular place. So territory in terms of diaspora is there, but it's also territory as in if you move there and you grew up there and you identify with the place, that also becomes part of your awareness. So whenever we talk about um, ethnic self-identification, I like to use the term territoriality because it can be actually physically being in a place, but it's actually also the ideological connection that one sees yes. uh, with it. Right. So, so, so that would be another dimension of it. Of course, language is a part of it, no? um, because then if you grow up somewhere, you learn the language. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that, that we tend to forget is that one can learn a language, so, um, but one can't change one's DNA. No? So, yes. so those are two distinct things. And then one can um, learn a technology. A technology can be passed. So let's say the making of cloth. That can be learned, yeah. that can right, that can be adopted. So we need to look at these attributes as integrate um connected, but they have very different mechanisms. So mm -hmm. territory is a very different mechanism. No? So parang um uh it becomes political, right? Do you still have access to your land? Uh, do you still own your land? Can you live there? Uh, and it certainly affects how you think about, um, you know, the, the place where your home is. And also the, the notion that we tend to think of indigenous peoples are fixed in one place, but they're not. They're not. Um, one of the interesting things about the Bogobo is that, uh, and I, of course, this is field work in the late 1990s, not in the early 2000s, but it's a pattern that we see even in the earlier um, reports. Uh, they have relatives by the sea and they have relatives in the mountain. So mm. people move, you know, back and yes. forth. Um, 
So you would have Pagopo settlements that are actually like today, Astorga, right, in Davao del Sur. That's actually a very old Pagopo settlement, right, uh, in Santa Cruz. But then the people there also have family up all the way up, 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 up into Daya, right, up in the mountains. And, and they go back and forth. No? Uh, so, so when we think of indigenous peoples and their territory, it's actually, you know, not just one place. I was born here, but I have family there. Balik -balik kami, no? so, so it's a... Um, so, so we have to think of territoriality as, as a very, um, not a fixed attribute. When I teach this in my, in my class, there's more than that. So I would always say descent, I would say uh, territoriality, I would say right, um, language, but then also self-ascription. So we have to take into account self-ascription. And self-ascription is probably the one that is very important because it's what people used to, uh, you know, in their daily life. But it's also a, a, a political reality, right? mm. ascribed or not ascribed depending on conditions. And it's probably also what will mess up a DNA study. <laughs> right? Okay. Um, right? Uh, not because people are lying, <laughs> yes. but, it, it, but it depends on the question, right? Yes. So oh, uh, we ask, oh, blan ka ba? I say, oh, yes. blan oh, oh. Uh, Or, you know, or Cebuano ka ba? Or whatever. Yes. Right? Oh. And people will say, and they will honestly say yes, no, but it depends on the question, right? So, so self-identification um, uh, is, is, uh, is, is a political uh, reality. And so um, <clears throat> that's where it, it, it needs to be. It's not impossible, but you need to kind of take into account what are you really, you know, what are you really studying? So I'm not sure, uh, it's not clear in the study because if, um, if they approached it, um, you know, through clusters, no, the sampling was done through clusters, or if these 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 uh, clusters emerge, hindi ko alam, no? I, I can't mm. tell uh, how they actually did it. But but for me, it was like very interesting that they were using linguistic terms. No, so because I know it will not work for the Bagovo for sure. Yes, yes. Um, uh, or at least if it did, they will be forcing them no, in, into one category over the other, which means you know uh, what are we really asking? No? So so that's kind of like, but yeah, but thank you. That's a that's a very good question. Um, it's one of those questions that have always bedeviled anybody that studies the Philippines. Because uh, yes. right? and uh, yes. like yes. group terms. There are so many group terms and it get it can get very confusing. Okay. Well, I've been dying to ask this uh, question since you began your talk. What about material culture? Is that a more stable uh, marker or indicator to the identity question? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. okay. <laughs> I, I mean, when you, when you talk about stable, no, yes. uh, as, as, I would say no, only because, yes. um, you know, like I said, technology spread. Yes. Uh, technology spread. Mm. So, especially for textiles, textiles are one of the most portable. No? So they travel, they travel yes. far, they can be traded, right? So, so in, in by by its own by its own principle, having material, having a, a similarity in material culture by itself, um, you will observe patterns, right? Mm -hmm. But they're not necessarily stable, right? Yes. So, so it, okay. it, it can okay. change. So, so for example, one of the things that, even though I'm focused always on abaka ikat, I'm slowly, you know, getting interested in cotton, for example, no? mm. and then I'm discovering like, okay, if they don't spin the cotton, where did the cotton come from? Then suddenly mm. I have to ask myself, um, you know, oh, was it Chinese imports? No, mm. <laughs> uh, mm. were they British cotton? Yes, so yes. suddenly the questions yeah. are like, where this, where this, so was the cloth? Where, where, where was this fun? Because because things move, no. Yes. But at the same time. Indigenous people say, I, I like that. I'll use that and incorporate it into uh -huh. my and, right into my garment. And what's there to stop them? Okay. Yeah, what's there to stop them? And yes. okay. now, and that's where we start seeing, ah, okay. Now the pattern then you can say, oh, what is a stable pattern? So I would I was arguing that a hundred years is a pretty stable pattern no, for for how a garment appears. Yes. But when you look at what they're made of, a paya batos up um of yes. Of yes. Garment, yes. Of polyester. Yes. Yeah, you that's mean. navy blue polyester. Yes. No? Yes. Uh, oh. With beadwork that they buy from NCCC and that yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um, but it's got the look. Yes. So right, it's not stable. No, it's not a bakad. The upper garment. No, the lower yes. garment's a The upper garment is not. Uh -uh. Um, 
uh, but the look, right? So, so it's a it's a no, but also can be a yes. So that's why I would say. So when we talk about material culture, um, we need to be, you know, we need to focus, you know, what about it? So I would say, I would say the idea is more stable, right? Okay. This notion of the is the aesthetic look. Uh, is more stable. And then they come up with strategies to solve it, no? Kung wala nang abaka, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, an alternate. Oh. Yeah, blue polyester that's thick, it's <laughs> perfect, no? Kasi uh, it has that look that they want. Um, and in the early 20th century, it was uh, it was basically cotton, like right? shop-bought cotton um, that's already dyed blue or red mm. or white. No? Can you imagine... Okay. A weaver and you spend a lot of time dying, then you go to the market and you see something that's already dyed. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why not? Oh, so, so it, yes. it kind uh-huh. of solves all kinds of problems. So, so it's an expression of of uh, of um of of um creativity as well. But this particular question is a very interesting one that I think the best insight we can get is would be from an archaeologist who study let's say one of the, my favorite is a study of coastal communities in Papua New Guinea, where they did it over time and they separate, you know, they looked at the distinction between language, right? And then particular artifacts, mm. uh, you know, and then they, they looked at the distribution over time. You know? And then we see that, you know, language moves differently because remember, you can learn a language, right? You can learn, I, I, you can acquire language in your lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and also, you can pick up new technologies in your lifetime. Um, so, so it's so they kind of map differently, shall we say? So, kailangan tingnan lahat, no? uh, which of course is not an easy answer. But I would say then you can say certain things. So, but yeah, material culture by itself, not really, right? I would say the idea of the aesthetic ideal, yun pa, yun pa, mas mm-hmm. yun. The aesthetic ideal tends to persi- persist more, but the actual thing. Hindi, maraming substitution. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh-huh. Yeah. okay. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another question from Kam Akram Rebukas. Hello, ma'am. I am an undergraduate student interested in cultural mapping and food anthropology, as well as its relation to the arts. Uh, what would be your advice on a methodology, uh, uh, cre- methodology creation uh, considering that many regions in the Philippines do not have accessible resources to students like myself? Um, I, I'm guessing it's a question about research methodology, you know, um, for, yes. for, yeah. Considering um, that there are lack of access to resources, like reference I, materials, I, would, I suppose. Yes, yes, for, for research. Um, I would say kung food cultures ang, ang, is, is the focus, no? Um, then we we would there there are ways to do it by focusing on your advantages so kunyari, if you're interested in, in a particular set of, of um, cuisines right uh collect recipes <laughs> collect recipes right. um uh, interview people about the dishes that they cook right document ingredients um and it sounds like you're training for to be a chef but i mean you know recipe books are are important uh, are important um documents actually they're important cultural documents so if you're interested in in food cultures now if you're not if you're not in cuisines per se it would be you know how, what what are the dishes you know so when i started i was just taking a lot of photos for example but i would just always make sure that i say okay what, what am i photographing and people will tell me what this is no and then i just go back and analyze it later on so if it's about dishes no uh, document the, the kinds of things that that you would encounter um and then over time you're going and if you have recipes then you'll actually even know the ingredient lists mm-hmm. um because then you'll be able to understand the mapping of certain ingredients for example so for example when the spanish came they introduced all of this stuff from the new world to us not lots of mexican fruits and vegetables for example um so that could be part of a historical mapping. So, so I guess that the answer I would give is that if you don't have a lot of access to, let's say, secondary research, like publications and journals and all of that, um, but there's enough, like especially for food, you know, the work of Doreen Fernandez in, in the Philippines, right, is, is a great, uh, important uh, kind of, you know, uh, she, she shined the light, right, on food as, as something worth thinking about and doing research on. Um, 
just go by way of, you know, if, if that's interesting to you, document it, right, as best as you can. And then when you have your documentation, you can, alongside that, you can do some ratings as well. Um, there's a great movement towards open source right, uh, publications now, especially after COVID. Um, and so even if you don't have the latest and the greatest journal articles, even if it's five years old or 10, 10 years old, no, you can make use of, of those older um, researches that, that you can get a hold of just to see um, the, the, the kinds of issues that you do like. So I would say yeah, on, on the side of you know, feeling that limitado yung mga access mo sa reading materials, just read, read as much as you can, get a, get a hold of all that you can uh, as much as possible. Um, and then you will discover uh, whose kind of uh, approaches uh, appeal to you um, and, and try to model that. No? But I would say, kung ganyan, siguro doi mo, you're reading Doreen Fernandez. That's, you know, that's, that's a, <laughs> even though Doreen Fernandez is not an anthropologist, but she, she, you know, she, she was doing uh, cuisine and cooking. There's a new book as well, but I think it was on colonial history, um, on, on American and colonial food. But, but yeah, my, my, if you have professors who are clearly getting you interested in this, uh, I, I guess you should bug them <laughs> to give you access to their vast library of Xerox articles <laughs> and uh, ask them for things to read. Um, but yeah, the nice thing is that if you do cultural mapping, um, there's a lot of things happening already around us. I think part of the part of our um, bias is that we tend to think about this notion of culture as being somehow static, no, as somehow not changing. No? The snapshot of food production and food preparation and food culture and food appreciation right now in 2022 is a valuable thing to document um, right now. Mm -hmm. So whatever people are doing right now. Uh, I heard chicken is really hard to get now in Manila, no? Uh, I, I, like, when I was a child, my favorite fish was galonggong, but apparently that's hard to get as well, no? So, so with, climate change, oh. yeah, with climate change or supply chain issues, right, how do cooks, right, respond, you know? How yes. do cooks change their, their, um, their, their practices, no? Uh, that's a valuable document, I think. So don't think that you have to go back to some lovely traditional time with sepia tone, right? <laughs> Heritage. It's the now. Now, now is interesting. Um, lalo na if people have challenges. No? What do they? What do they use to substitute? No? Um, uh, if if you're a street vendor, uh, you know, what do you do if the price of chicken goes up? No. So um, I think those those are what brings to the fore then 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 the decision making will be okay i did this because and if you talk to them they will tell you because i'm trying to go for this therefore i did that so even the process of substitution makes accessible to us the in the heads of people the culinary ideal so again the ideal is constant this is how you know pakbit should be <laughs> you know uh, this is how uh sinigang is supposed to be uh, but right now, this is what I'm doing. No? Uh, so, so the ideal tends to be more stable, the cultural ideal. But then the actual practice, I think, is very interesting. So that's that's my suggestion, you know, that to kind of really immerse yourself in what people are doing. And then you'll discover, oh, that's interesting. If you think that's interesting, it means other people will also find that interesting. No? So just kind of note those things down. So that would be my advice. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Doc. Now, um, there's another question, a more general question. From Carlito Kamahalan Amalia. Oh, um, <laughs> okay. What are your challenges and triumphs in your field research, Padayon? Oh dear. Challenges and triumphs. Okay, so that's yeah, that's a big question. Um, I guess uh, early on in my field research, the challenge was getting funding, <laughs> right? That was the, um, uh, and then so the, and so it was very disheartening at the beginning. But then the challenges also produce the triumphs because then when I said, well, I'll do it anyway, I'll find a way, um, I'll still kind of, you know, I, I just have to keep on talking about what I want to do and, and trying to find ways to do it. So before there was any kind of funding, um, I discovered that there was a lot of folks who were willing to help me by volunteering their time, for example. 
so you know so in the early age stages um i had an education i had the question but i didn't have funding <laughs> so so how do i how do i implement this so you know uh i had to try to be as creative as possible and and just to kind of keep on going right, and see where 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 it led me so that was that was the, the challenge and and the and the triumphs of course would be that finding out that you know over time there are enough people uh, that will hear about what you would like to do and then they come forward and, and help you so so that's the logistical part the logistical part from the analysis part um when you're in the field and then you have all this, this data it takes several lifetimes to actually analyze all that data it's, okay. it's a um, you know, I several don't think I will be able. Yeah, several lifetimes. I don't think I will ever be able to do it all. Um, and it became clear to me during COVID when I was proposing, because during COVID I was on sabbatical. I was supposed to do all kinds of things, and I couldn't because I only had to stay home. So I was forced to go back to my field notes, start digitizing them, and looking at them again. And then I discover all these things in there right, that I I uh, had forgotten that, that they were there. So so um, so I guess. The insight from that is that uh, I think I told this to another another pe- person I was speaking to. The the thing is that mabuti na lang. I said it's a good thing that I was very systematic. So that's the only thing I can say. Um, so that my field notebooks I paginated them. Right. So my notebooks I hand wrote page one, page two, page three. Right. My field notebooks are numbered. Notebook one, notebook two, notebook three, right? My 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 photos are are long. I would have you know roll one, roll two, roll three, shot one, shot two, you know, so so that even afterwards anybody who can use it will then be able to refer to right to 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 your to your notes, and you yourself can navigate your own notes. So that's another. It's a small kind of you might say a small kind of good thing that I see, you no know, na. Ah, I can go back. So now I see an image and I go, oh, oh my God, you know, where did I take this? I don't remember. Put in a lang, I wrote on the back the shot mm-hmm. and roll number <laughs> and I could go in my log. Ah, this was 1994 and that was 1997. Mm-hmm. So, so little things like that. And, you know, that doesn't cost any money. That's mm-hmm. just, uh, that's just patience. Um, and um, I guess a, a commitment to trying to be as systematic as possible. Um and to be um, uh, to 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 believe in the value of of your data uh, that it might not be clear now what this might be for, but this will be valuable. So, so yes, so those would be like um, and remember, you know, the most valuable aspects of my research were all done when I was young and underfunded uh, and. <laughs> Right, okay. uh, and not sure of what I will do. No, so so it's a, um, so it's it's kind of like that. It's more of like keeping your intellectual curiosity alive, I guess, um, which can be a, a challenge. It can be a challenge. So so, and then of course finding your way in the world. So for example, um, I have I I have professionally I'm okay, no, but. But I, I don't kid myself. I was not hired because of my research. I was hired because of my teaching. But I just happened to have research. Right? So, so um, for others, they're more fortunate. They will be hired because of their research. For me, I teach about my stuff. You know, but uh, much of what I do is I teach bread and butter or rice and ulam kind of courses no? uh, that are not necessarily about the Philippines. Um, so that can be a challenge as well. That, that, that other challenges, I, you might say, uh, intellectual loneliness sometimes, no? mm. which can be solved in other ways. So I, I solve it for sure by joining fora such as this. No? Um, and and I, you know, for more than 10 years now, I'm no longer intellectually lonely. <laughs> I've found uh, a large community of, of yes. scholars. Um, but in the in the early days, it was difficult. Right? It was difficult. So it's it's kind of like that. It's a, it's an intellectual journey and also a certain um, commitment to your questions, I guess, no? um, to your scholarship. Um, and then you know, over time, you discover that there. This is the best part, you know. The, 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 I, I get contacted now by lots of young people, right? So I, I think that's exciting. Young people are interested uh, and they have different questions. So that's another. I would call that a triumph, I guess, not that, that mm-hmm. it engages uh, 
um, young people. So, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Doc, there's another question uh, from Mark Hornedo. He apologizes that he missed your answer regarding the groupings. But uh, the the question, other than uh, how the how do subgroups occur, is how do you classify them together? Oh, uh, as far as why the bagobo are together, maybe I'm assuming that that's what it means, not that yes, that. yes. Uh -huh. So, so for me, the first would be self identification. Somebody says, I am this, right? I take that as, okay, what does that mean? So I, I begin with that, no? Um, and then, of course, I, it's not limited to one person. You know, how many times does this occur? Who refers to themselves as such? So, so on, on the, from the point of view of fieldwork, if somebody says, I am such, you just document it. You just describe it, right? You, you just kind of uh, put that down and then just, continue gathering observations. The analysis comes later when you say, okay, what do they mean? Like for me, this this perception of, of like tatlo pala yung bagobo, no? tatlong, tatlong wika, tat three languages, it never occurred to me really. I mean, I and before I came to the field, I was already well read. I read, right? I read everything I could get my hands on, uh, on the bagobo. And I've already visited a couple of museums, right? Not, not everything, but I visited a couple. Um, and even I was surprised. I got to the field, I go, oh my, you know, I have to choose. Nako, paano na? <laughs> so parang, so, so the, the answer to that would be, I, what, I, what I do when I classify or when I say that this is the group and this is what's going on, I always will call it my, our, our, I would say our best guess. So it's always our best guess at, at that point in time. So for me, this is my best guess based on my reflection on the field work, my reflection on reading other research. No? Um, I can speculate, of course, no? but for me, I, I, I tend to be very conservative. Um, this is my best guess. So someone asked me, for example, the term Bagobo, how old is that term? No? How old is that category? How old is that group? I'm pretty sure it predates 1880 because it can't be so stable by 1880. No? It's so stable, it's so consistent mm. by 1880. But because I don't I haven't yet found, but it doesn't mean I won't. No, I haven't yet found any evidence of evidence. its usage prior to 1880, right around that time. I won't say it. I would say maybe, no, I'm predicting it. So I guess this is the beauty of theory building. No, I'm predicting that it will be found in some other collection somewhere, some archival collection no? um, in terms of um, terminology. Um, but I won't say it until I, I, you know, I see it for my yes, own and yes. I'm able to determine. So, so, so it's, it's, uh, it could change. It could really change. And, you know, when you have new data, yeah, I, that could all change. I could be wrong. You know, uh, this is my best guess. No, this is my best guess. So when I say ito yon, um, this is my best guess based on what evidence yes, we have yes. before us, mm -hmm. no? which is how really scholarship should be. No? Yes. Kaya nga, that might be also part of the challenge when we have like national laws like the, you know, the, like, like the IPRA, no? the challenge of, of, of things like IPRA, um, you know, it's very well-meaning. It, it intends to do a lot of things, pero it tends to, uh, in a way, without meaning to, it, it kind of um, changes the behavior of, of how people respond mm. to these um, two ways of, ethnic self-identification. Self no? So biglang, kasi it becomes bureaucratized. Right? So, so uh, politicized when, when even. Some, oh. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's not because someone is bad or someone is good. It's it's our response to structural constraints. No? So biglang, um, oh, I have to check a box. <laughs> you, know, para, uh, you know, and then the question is, can I make my own box? No? Uh, or, you know, but then usually the answer is no, you can't make your own box. No? So you check a box. And over time, checking a box really kind of right, forges a specific identity. One of the interesting things in the U.S., for example, is that race, race, um, anal uh, race uh, criticisms on race, right? Critical uh, theories on race are, are very big. It can make careers if you're doing race, right? And, you, and it doesn't mean that there is no racism. Of course, there's racism. But what's interesting is that you know Americans who are very immersed in in race. Um, race um, relations and race theory and race history uh, sometimes get surprised that when they leave the US right it's a different it's a different set of challenges because 
the history of, of how race was bureaucratized, right? And how it was racialized in the U.S. is specific to the U.S. Mm-hmm. And when you cross the pond in Britain, it's different, right? Of course, there's still racism, but it's not the same kind. No, it's, it's based on, on different things. And you go to North Africa, you know, so it's, it's like wherever you go, you go to Brazil. Uh, so, so it's a, so from an anthropological standpoint, we would always say that, that, you know, it has to be polythetic, you know, the category of, of ethnicity or, or self-identification uh, because the conditions on the ground essentially define how you self-identify, right? Mm. You will hide certain aspects of your identity if it will cost you to be killed, right? So, so for example, people will say, oh, um, they're, they're converts or they're that religion or that religion. And then, because then they assume that people also um, don't intermarry, let's say, between religious groups, especially if those religious groups are actually clashing. No? But in reality, people will just hide that because, you know, on the ground they say, well, you know, it's, if it's going to be, it would cause my family to be, um, to be killed, some will flee, but some will just convert. Mm. You know, uh, and then over time, that conversion gets mapped onto DNA. But in reality, it's not, you know, so because yes. it's, it's actually a, a social identity. You know? So so it's a very this is what I find interesting about about doing this kind of research, right? That it's about how the strategies by which people make decisions about self-identification are, are really, really interesting. And it really varies right, uh, from time to time. So so when I speak of Bagobo, for example, this is like from my research of, of this point in time. It might change still. No, in fact, it probably is changing, uh, be- not the least because of IPRA no, and even NCCA. No, so, so all of these things uh, can, can actually affect um, the stability uh, of, of groups and subgroups. No? So it's not, not, uh, not fixed in time, I would say. I hope that answers that question. Maybe it made it more complicated. <laughs> it is a complicated question, though, actually. Doc, uh, another question from uh, Alexis Parks. This is a rather a long question. With the knowledge of the intricacies of the Bogobo identity, what do you think about the future of Filipino or Taumpili identity? How can the complexities of various ethnolinguistic indigenous identities be integrated into a semblance of a united Filipino identity? Or will the more que- complex groupings of Filipino identities become more normalized to lessen the need for a single Filipino or Taumpili identity? Can these uh, uh, ethnolinguistic or indigenous uh, groups, identities be integrated at all in the mainstream, taking the consideration the the variations in knowledge systems among peoples? Wow. Um, I think, yeah, that that's a, I can't speak about Taumpili. I haven't encountered that term before, yes. but I'm assuming it's Tao and then Filipino. Yes. And also yes. something, uh, some kind of hybridization, right, of, mm. of terminology. So I can't address that because I don't know enough about it. But I can address the question of integration. You know? So, so the, you know, in the, in the Young Philippine Republic set out to integrate, you know? so yes. the Commission on National Integration. And mm. then the Philippine Republic now, I, I know but I was Republic Seven. I, I don't know Seventh Republic. I don't know what Republic we're in, right? Um, it certainly moved away from the notion of integration, and right? it moved towards this notion, right, of of uh, was coming from the ancestral domain and legal uh, terminology, right? It's it certainly this notion of of uh, of indigenous people's rights. So, how do you carve a nation, right, out, out of that? I think that's the question. And I guess I would say that we need to accept um, that the nation is actually um, a very new right, artifact right? Um, and that it really has to be. It's, it's, a, it's, a, very, it's a very young concept, right? Uh, the term of nation, well, some would say, well, you know, of course, nations are, are much, much older. But, but I would argue it's the, the concept of a monoculture nation. That's mm-hmm. new. That's very new. Kingdoms in the past, right? The Normans, right? Uh, Goths, right? Uh, kingdoms of the past um, uh, would tend to be, you know, let's say monoculture, monolingual, maybe as specific to a particular uh, place in time. 
but modern monoculture nation states um, is is fairly new. It comes. Uh, I mean, the the best example I can think of would be you know the the French Revolution, right? So if you think of the French Revolution, uh, what makes the French Revolution? What, why did they imagine themselves as a new nation? First, they got rid of the king, right? So no king. So if you rem- because before it was the king, it was the king that united you, right? Your allegiance to the king and king being attached to God, right? So it was this whole mm-hmm. kind of chain of being. That wasn't monoculture. We had the old king. The king was a king of all kinds of subjects, no? Um, but then when they took off the king, so what's your basis now? Right? Mm. So the, the, the answer was revolution. It means that people who shared the experience of revolution are now right, brothers, like mm. fraternity, right? Fraternity, liberty. Yeah. 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 So, so if you think about that, they said, okay, here we are, we're all one nation. Um, but the problem is we actually aren't, right? Because you just cut off the king and now you, know, you have to kind of build this nation. Uh, from scratch. So the, the French model therefore says, well, okay, what what how do we do it? So they agreed it has to be one country, it has to be one language, right? It has to be one history. Then you have these rituals of right the Bastille Day, right? you have this kind of rituals of incorporation. So in a sense, you know, you created the nation, right? Uh, but but if you really look at France linguistically, right, there are actually different languages in France. Um, but um there is this famous quote, I think it was from Charles de Gaulle, which is, you know, Charles de Gaulle is post-war, right? Post-war, uh, uh, you might say national hero, one of the heroes uh, of, of France. Uh, he says, you know, uh, the problem with, with ruling France is that, that there are 246 cheeses. In other words, they have so much cheese, right? And all the cheeses have different terms, right? Which means that, you know, you have, and, and then, you know, when you look at it, it's not just really French. There are actually many languages in France. No? Uh, so, so, but then you have to kind of minimize that mm-hmm. and say, no, it has to be this language. So the process of creating a, a, an integrated single nation is actually a project. Right? It's always been a project. Right? It's not, quote, unquote, natural. Yeah. Humans essentially have to make it happen. No? So, um so what, what the model is. So the, the, the one that I think applies more to us in the Philippines would be models such as like, you know, what Ben Anderson did when he was thinking about Indonesia. Because Indonesia, when it was born as a country, right, never assumed that it was because they shared the language. because They can't. It's, they're too big, you know, too many languages that they shared an ethnicity. They can't, right, share a religion. They can't, even though it's a Muslim nation. They know that they're not all Muslim, right? So, so for them, it was more like an agreement to be a country based on whatever was under the Dutch, right? Mm. That's why they have a piece of Western Papua New Guinea, right? I, I mean, Irian Jaya, right? Which is now a problem of right? <laughs> recession, uh, secession there, right? Um, so every, every country, every nation, right, is, is essentially uh, an artifact, right? So for us, when we problematize it, Let's not think about finding some kind of, you know, uh, original Filipino. Mm -hmm. We emerged because of national consciousness. So the national consciousness was shaped because we were fighting against a colonizer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Actually colonizers, right? It's not just Mm -hmm. the Spanish. Several of them. Yeah, several of them. American, later the Japanese. So so Spanish, American, Japanese. Uh So, so. And you know, and you, and and this is not just limited to us, right? So, so uh, some would say that somebody argued that the Russian identity, for example, emerged because they were fighting against a common enemy from the outside, the Mongols, right? So, because they were being attacked, by, then they, you know, they they formed this identity because it was like, oh, we are we are so different. So, so I wouldn't worry too much about about that, you no, know, uh, in terms of finding something that's common and original, and you know. Um, that was already one of the big problems of prior of attempts, diba? To look for, you know, malakas at maganda, you know, then, then you would have this emerging from the bamboo, no? Okay. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a desire. It's an understandable desire for something primeval. But let's just take a look at it as what it is. It's an agreement by people today to think about what makes us up as a nation, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and, and so integration was a model once that was 
thought of as a good model. Today, it's not a good model, but the idea is still there because there's such a desire no, mm. for, for this. Um, there's such a hunger for, for something that is uh, just one thing. Um, and, and we can't be just one thing. I mean, it, it, it will have to be a model of, of, of uh, you know, an agreement to be a country. Uh, and then the vision of what that country will be like, right? So, so a multilingual, multicultural country, which is what we are, um, um, and 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 uh, move it on from there. I I would say I hope that answers that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Doc. Uh, another question, Doc. Uh, we have uh, three more questions uh, before we cap off the session. Uh, Christian Rosales asks, could you oh, kindly comment on Laura Watson Benedict's ethnographic writing style, which I think espouses the importance of thick description in relation to how modern anthropologists writes, write, eth, writes ethnography. Thank you. Yeah. So, so Laura Watson Benedict, um, her style, yes, it, it is, it is a, a very absorbing, a very involved style. And, and she's really ahead of her time. Um, and, uh, you know, Whenever you do an anthropology uh, theory or history of theory course, they will always tell you that that um, long-term field research was pioneered by Malinowski, but Laura Watson Benedict was already doing her research, right? Um, be, you know, before before Malinowski got stuck in the Trobriand Islands. Um, so so it's um, but she she's certainly a pioneer of, of her time. Um, Thick description is a term that we associate with Clifford Geertz, yes. who, who um, was, was famous much later in the 20th century, right? Uh, when he was writing his famous work, right, describing the Balinese cockfight. Yes, right? yes. So that's the famous one. But it's interesting that, that he, we, you know, we would apply it to, to Laura Watson Benedict. She was a student of Boas. Um, she was also a very unique individual. She was committed to her research. Um, she did not live a good life. It was a very hard life for her. She mm. couldn't get a job. She couldn't get funding. She never got funding, right? So, um, and uh, she ended up, I think, you know, uh, quite poor, right? And, and quite sick and in, in the end of her days. So she wasn't really able to, to, to flourish professionally. But her writing style certainly is committed to... Um, trying to capture right the, the complexity of, of what was before her. So if you compare her writings, let's say to the writings of other students of Boas, who tend to write almost more quote unquote scientifically, more clinically. Yes, I agree. Laura Watson Benedict seems to write more in the I don't mean this in a derogatory term, not in a more novelistic style. No? So it's it's actually a very modern way of, of writing. Right? So so she she kind of brings in um it's almost stream of consciousness in some cases, no. Uh, but that's in in her in her big book, right? But in some of her shorter pieces, it, you see that it becomes a little bit more um, clinical as well. But yes, there's certain things, there's certain um, thick, um, not thickness, certain fullness of 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 content that is transmitted through that kind of writing style. So as you're reading, let's say her stuff and you're reading and she calls it for example I don't know um she'll write about weaponry for example right or she'll write about musical instruments or she'll be writing about she says about um a ritual but when you're reading it it's it's got so much in there that's not just confined to what she says she's writing about so suddenly she'll talk about oh this person did this and did that so maraming pumapasok ano, that 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 is not necessarily part of what she's supposed to be focusing on, which is an attribute right, of thick description, right? It, it tends to mm. kind of, like, um, you know, bring in all of these details um, that actually allow us to have very good context of, of what she was, what she was um, examining. So yes, I would, I would agree. I would agree that, that there's a certain kind of, um, you know, modernity, right? In, in, in how she was writing. Um, and um but she was also kind of a very unusual person. So, so you know, we were kind of fortunate that, that she she um, she ended up um, doing work among the Bagopo. Okay, thank you. Doc. Uh, on a similar um, uh, light, uh, there's another question here from Chelsea K. Marquez Mara. 
this time around, uh, she asks, what is your take uh, uh, between Bellwood's out of Taiwan hypothesis and the island origin hypothesis by Solheim? Uh, considering that language can be learned without people moving. Okay, so this is probably that big debate, well, one of the big debates I mentioned earlier that I can't wade into. It's a really big debate. Right? So, so the, the Bellwood, right, the out of Taiwan, and then um, in Solheim. And I want to add to that the other one that comes from the notion of out of Papua New Guinea. So Maramian and also this, but that's just about three. Um, I do read their arguments. My research cannot necessarily speak to Bellwood's out of Taiwan hypothesis per se, because I'm interested in another in the in the bottom end of that theorizing, which is what can we say, right? About in my case, uh, banana, right? This is like my my this is my deeper time depth research, not Bagobo per se, but banana textile, because then banana textile does not have an ethnicity. No? <laughs> banana textile is uh, you know, Mindanao, but not just one group. Right? Um, so that research doesn't necessarily um, say that one is, is, is right or one is wrong, but it can contribute in terms of what we're learning now about you know, uh, the extent by which um, these practices have, have spread. The part of language there is interesting, right? Because when you're looking at, at just the Bagobo or even Southern Mindanao, the language terminology becomes very, very complex really quickly, right, on the ground. So when you're trying to do stuff that refer to, let's say, textile technologies, I think the more important questions would not necessarily be terms, although that can become important, but, but what kinds of terms? So it would be, I would say, things that other people have done in other parts of, of this larger discourse, right? Looms. Mm. So we have to look at looms, loom terms, right? Um, are there looms? Are there not looms, for example? Right? So, so that's how I think that this type of research can contribute to that. So if we're going to look at, at, at linguistic terms at all, it will be terms for that, right? Um, parts of looms, right? The, 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 not the comb, right? If there's a part of the loom that, that has a comb. Now, some have a comb, some do not, right? So they not. So it, it becomes very technical really quickly, but it would be certain aspects of, let's say, the textile that would contribute to that larger discussion, right? So it would be, um, so, so for example, banana textiles are also found, let's say, in, the, in Micronesia, right? But they don't use looms but they use banana textile, for example, right? So, so you have this kind of interesting, and of course my whole big thing, banana textiles in the Philippines, in Southern Philippines use ikat, right? Mm. But they don't use ikat everywhere banana textiles are done. So, so, so for my kind of research, that's where I see it might contribute to that larger conversation uh, that, 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 that emerges with that whole, you know, uh, Bellwood and, and Solheim, right? And, and also the, the, the Papua New Guinea people. Um, I think it's a very interesting question, you know, because Bellwood, of course, is first looking at, at um, basically agriculture, right? So he's looking at agriculture as, as one of, of the markers, right? Um, and, um, and in Solheim's case, yes, it's, it's true. Language, and I'm glad that that came up because, you know, we just need to always be aware of what it is that we are distinguishing. So um, language terms would be, like I said, loom terms, right? Or parts of loom terms or maybe terms for cloth itself, right? That's been done by, by, by people who study um, these kinds of things. But yes, it's true. And I have said this much, um, technologies move. So when you have a shared term, is it because that term traveled with the technology? That mm -hmm. seems to be the assumption so far, no? So um, that the term must have traveled with the technology. Um, is it so, so? If that's the case, then that leads to a certain set of analysis, right? So mm -hmm. if we find that yeah. it means right, so then 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 people will say, okay, then let's just go at the linguistic, and then we'll say, you know, this came from that. But the problem is, if the term travels with the technology, uh, then what are we actually saying? Do we say that the people traveled 
with the term and the technology. Yes. Oh. Right? And so some would say no. Some would say, yeah, the people can stay in one place, right? which is the Solheim thing, right? You know, the, the technology can travel with the term, but the people stayed in place. So, so yes, these, these are, these are um, but, but when you're dealing with very big time depths, you have to start somewhere, right? So, so they begin by saying, well, let's assume this. What do we find? What if we change the assumption, what do we find? So this is really where hypothesis testing comes in, right? But what's important is to at least know what do we know? so that we can identify what we don't know, right? So we can say, for example, oh, ito, let's collect terms, right? Let's collect terms, which is what part of what I do, no? You collect terms. Um, you collect all the information. May loom, walang loom. Diba? May ikat, walang ikat. What kind of loom? Is it a closed warp or not? You know, you know so what kind of we, right? So we start kind of collecting this information, um, which is, of course, not part of, what people value about it. People value the beauty of the cloth. They don't value whether it's a closed or open warp, right? You know, this is, this is more like our scientific question, uh, but that's our task. Right? And then if we just keep on always being aware of that, you know, that to disambiguate that, I think it's possible to keep on kind of running models. Right? You just kind of run the models, you know, and then see what comes out. So I, I find um, the debate actually very, very good. Um, because then it, it kind of forces us to explain our thinking, right? Yes. It kind of forces us to um, go back to our data and, and say, you know... Uh, question our assumptions. Yeah, question our assumptions, right? Um, and, and so it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing. Uh, it's uh, probably the value of, right, of, of scholarship, right? Which is why it's good to share data because the, the data can be shared, but the analysis... Could all be very different, right? And we always benefit from other people's analysis. And you can debate about the analysis, but not about the data, right? So we, we hope to get to have good data at least, so that we can then move the debate to other things. But yeah, thank you for that for that question. I'd like to thank you for answering all the questions uh, um, extensively. And uh, I would like to end the session by asking uh, if you'd like uh, to make a few words uh, to, for our, to our viewers. Um, if you have a message for them, uh, just to as a concluding or parting uh, uh, salvo. Oh, um, well, all I can say is that, well, as you can see, I asked some of my former professors in grad school to attend some of these talks that I've given, especially over COVID. No? And my, one of my professors said to me, Cherry, you really get into the weeds. <laughs> it's true. Like, <laughs> I'm very geeky. No? Uh, I, I don't apologize for it. I'm sorry. Right? This is this yeah. is uh, um, and I and I and so I think for me it's like um, um, intellectual curiosity is is important um, in all realms, and I'm just so I feel very honored that that uh, some people are interested in my work. I used to always joke with my colleagues. I'm the world's expert in, in, in my field, except maybe only 10 people know about my research, you know, because it's a very niche, right? It's a very niche thing. But over time, I'm discovering that this very, that what began as seemingly a very niche question, right, has all these things to offer that surprised me, that continued to surprise me. So I, I guess it will be a message of hope that, that whatever your pursuit might be, just make, I guess this is my thing. Not do your best to disseminate it and share it, um, because other people will will benefit. I'm one of those. I'm very slow in publishing. Uh, I'm not like one of those people that can produce ten things at one time. I have one every two years. No? So, but that's okay. I accept that about myself. Other people are more productive. No, um, and so yeah, it's it's like to keep I guess uh, your your intellectual. Um, uh, curiosity alive and, and kind of like follow follow your instincts. And yeah, always read widely and think broadly. Um, and yes, again, I see Cora's camera is on. Cora, thank you for, you know, who, who else gets invited? Any topic you like, Cherry? I go, wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I, thank, I thank you and Muscat, right, I, I, <laughs> uh, for, for this opportunity. Hello, Cherry, the, the honor is ours. And uh, just to let you know a few things, we like Geeky, and we like that you do your best and you share. 
So kudos and thanks to you. You presented quite an unconventional, innovatory discourse on art, on language and ethnicity, dress and identity. And thank you for answering all the questions brought to you comprehensively, patiently, unselfishly, candidly, with cheer and much humor, and live in real time. Maraming maraming salamat for staying up into the very early morning or waking up early. Which one is it? Dr. Kizon, for those who do not know, is in the East Coast, and there's a 12-hour difference, I think, in time. Cherry, we wish you continued success in your research endeavor. Hindi lang naman sampo ang nakakaalam na ng expertise mo. We look forward to your favoring us with another talk. Your hectic uh, chairman uh, schedule permitting. And I think you should know, Dr. Kizon is a box office draw from Muscat's most popular podcast to this afternoon's talk. Health situation, situation permitting, we would prefer to see Cherry here. Sana. To our participants, followers, friends, we hope to see you next month. We shift from anthropology to photography in August as we look forward to an encounter with Mr. John Silva, director of Ortigas Library Foundation, as he assays vintage photographs of peoples and places in the Philippines. Meanwhile, we will appreciate your feedback. Do let us know what else you would like our subject matter experts to explore and share with you. And do continue to be our partners in safeguarding and celebrating Philippine culture. For announcements, we are on Facebook and Instagram. We are also on YouTube and Spotify. Do like us. Maraming salamat at magandang paggabi na yata po sa kanilang lahat hanggang sa susunod na buwan at kabanata ng aming lecture series 2022. Ingat po tayong.